to the SIP series on The Stir. I'm your host, Trish Moiko Tobin, and right alongside with me is my binge bestie and my co-host, Debbie Baldwin. Hey, Debbie. Hi, Trish. Thanks for having me. Oh, of course, of course. And so Debbie is the author of the hot suspense-filled novel, False Front, which, as many of you know, was released in May. And if you haven't gotten your hands on it, my goodness, you're missing a great read. Whether it's by the beach, there you go, next to the pool, uh, under the shade. (laughs) And she's got extras, hey. (laughs) Um, You know, it's really the ultimate escape. Deb, I understand the book is gaining even more buzz. It's gotten some great reviews. And also it's been featured in book clubs. Yes, it's, um, I, I've been so kind of blown away by the response. Um, I think I'm right around 85 star reviews on Amazon. Um, the official reviewers, bloggers who've reviewed it have been effusive, which is so flattering. Um, for those of you who are waiting for the next installment, it's in the offing. So, um, yeah, it's been a very rewarding experience and I, you know, can't wait to just keep diving into these characters and as we're going to talk about today, these settings, which is such a huge part of a novel. Yes, exactly. I mean, most of us have really sought refuge in books to transport us away from all this craziness that's going on right now. Yeah. And if you're like Debbie and me, you know the power that books can have. And Deb, you know, False Front is really takes place, a lot of the action takes place in New York City along the East Coast. And why um, those settings for you? Why did you choose it as an author? Um, Well, the main reason is that I have experience living in all of those places. And um, New York City, as you know, Trish, we shot our TV show in 2016 uh, in New York City. And the block where the main character lives is very near the block where I lived with my writing partner um, while we were filming the show. So I was familiar with all the restaurants and stores and I know things change, but the vibe of the block is, you know, really something that when you live there and can experience, it just informs the writing in such a great way. And, you know, I know I'm an avid reader and I know that when I read (laughs) books and the author clearly has not been to a place that he or she is describing that it can be very frustrating. So I try to make a huge effort to really give a detailed description of the place and also just, you know, as I said, the vibe, like part of this book is set on Nantucket and there's definitely like a something in the air there that you feel you're there and that really only being there you can experience so that's why i chose those locations and the second book is mainly set in new york almost exclusively Uh Um, so and it explores different areas of the city um, that i've also lived in at various points in my life we venture a little further out into the boroughs and um Brooklyn and Brooklyn Heights, and it's really fun mentally and physically revisiting those places, so. And that's the thing, too, with the setting. Uh, You really depend, you know, if we're talking about a book, you really depend on the writer to take you there, to to give you um, the experience of being in a place. And so we also get this experience in the movies, as you know, and that is what we're going to be talking about today because, you know, many of us still really stuck at home and major travel nowadays is really hard to come by. And so what we hope is we wanna take you there through the magic of film. So Deb, we're really talking about um, movies in which their locations play a starring role in the film. Uh, Films that, you know, the setting is central to the plot. Absolutely. and. I stuck with films that are set in the place where they're filmed. So, you know, as wonderful as The Shire is, 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, and really those films are shot, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings are shot in New Zealand. But I stuck with this um, parameter because it's, there's just so many films. So if we start getting into, you know, Tatooine and Star Wars or Wakanda in Black Panther, it needs to be a whole separate list. Right, right. You're right. I mean, newsflash, you really can't travel to Wakanda right now. There's no <laughs> Wakanda. <laughs> yes. So we want to stay as true as possible. And, you know, the, the object really is to showcase a lot of these destinations that many of us can't get to right now. Yeah, and there's just so many times in my life, and I'm sure this has happened to you, where you walk out of a movie and you, you kind of just think, oh my God, I need to go to <laughs> that place. And you know, it's just like watching a cinematic postcard almost. Sure, from, exactly. And, and certainly there are certain directors, and we're gonna talk about them as we go through the list, who are masters at making the setting almost another character in the story. Yes, definitely. So our first movie on the list, probably not something you think about when you're in the middle of a heat wave right now, because we're going to transport you to the desert. But at the same time, since, you know, this, a trip like this really requires long-term planning. <laughs> so um, our first movie on the list is from 1962. And we're talking about uh, just a masterpiece and just a landmark in filmmaking. And that is, of course, Lawrence of Arabia. Um, yeah, Lawrence of Arabia, uh, if you haven't seen it, you know, it's one of those films that took every Oscar its year. Um, David Lean directed um, a genius director, at, uh, you know, who brought us films like Dr. Zhivago and The Bridge Over the River Kwai, and really his imagination knew no bounds as a director. And that's Lawrence of Arabia, the story of T.E. Lawrence, based on his novel, The Seven Pillars of Wisdom. Um, so the movie is the story of T.E. Lawrence trying to unite the tribes of Africa during World War I. And it is an expansive film shot in Morocco and throughout uh, the Jordan, northern, Jordan throughout yes. the northern Sahara, um, in what is supposed to be what would have been at the time uh, Syria. And um, but it's just a gorgeous film shot on a fifteen million dollar budget, if you can believe it. Exactly. And, you know, I have to admit, I never saw this film straight from beginning to end. It clocks in at what? Three hours and 36 minutes. It's a so long... I've seen it in bits and pieces. Yeah. And it's, you know, he, there's a little bit of, I don't know, scenery chewing is not the right word because the scenery is so <laughs> expansive. Yes. But um, scenery feasting, maybe. Yes. But yeah. It's a slow paced film and you really have to kind of settle in for it. But it's, gorgeous and beautifully acted and an interesting story and and just know, the I, cast those the yeah. slate of actors my god how impressive is that and you know you mentioned that this film was made for 15 million dollars in 1962 steven spielberg one of our favorite directors estimates that if this film were being made today it would cost 285 million dollars and I mentioned Spielberg because this is his all-time favorite movie. I happened to watch that documentary on him on HBO, um, you know, that's making the rounds right now on HBO. And he talks about how this was the movie that inspired him to be a filmmaker. I mean, he is gaga over <laughs> Lawrence of Arabia. And as if you needed another reason to see it, but you can, so I can understand Spielberg saying that because the visionary, I mean, the film was so groundbreaking at the time to bring this crew out to, you know, the middle of the Sahara to shoot these scenes is, you know, just incredible. The scope and yes. the am amount of crew and cast involved in it. I mean, it was really a groundbreaking production. And I think too, I mean, if you think about it, you really see some of the influence that this film has had on young Steven Spielberg in terms of that, that wide shot cinematography. Yeah. You see that in 
in Indiana Jones, you know, some of those wide shots. Yeah. Um, but also one thing that I found really neat about this movie, and again, you have to watch it again to, to get these nuances and just talking about the cinematography just because of the scope. You know, much of the film is shot from left to right to signify a journey, um, you know. Yeah. So when you watch that film again, if you didn't get that before, and, and the, the scenes that I've seen, you know, it really shows you that. And so talking about Peter O'Toole um, and how this role really transformed his, his stardom pretty much, um, Brando, Marlon Brando, was the very first choice for this film. But of course, Brando being Brando said that he, he's not gonna be able to stand um, two years riding on a camel. So he, he rejected the role. <laughs> And the second choice, believe it or not, did you know this? It's Albert Finney, relatively yeah. unknown at the time. He actually wow. underwent rigorous and costly screen tests for the movie. And in fact, his uh, screen test on tape, um, one of the most requested uh, items from the British Film Archives, because you've got this rare take of Albert Finney um, dressed head to toe in Arab gear, in Arab costume, and it's in the British Film Archives, and it's, huh. you know, he'll be forever connected to this movie. So yeah, so before Peter O'Toole, we had Brando, we had Finney, and then Peter O'Toole, of course, and it's an unforgettable role for him. Yeah. All right, so from 1962, we're really gonna make a, a a big jump to the late 80s, 1989. And we are talking New York City, Upper West Side, pretty much all over the city, really. And we are talking about when Harry met Sally. And I have to say, um, it, when Harry met Sally, the problem for me is that it's <laughs> such a fantastic film that the setting, while spectacular, I mean, it's, a postcard tribute to New York City um, in the, you know, and I think, you know, I mentioned to you that really if we we're going to do New York City, we really should have stuck with like a Woody Allen movie because he is the undisputed map sure, sure. showing Manhattan and New York in its most beautiful light. But when you mentioned when Harry met Sally, I did think, you know, it doesn't jump into my head at first blush because you're you know, so caught uh, up in the story between the these story. two people. And let's be honest, the Cat's Deli <laughs> faking <laughs> orgasm scene it steals that movie yeah. every single time. So you, um, you know, Billy Crystal is hilarious. Meg Ryan in all her quirky glory is amazing. They're just perfect foils for each other. Um, so, so many interesting things about this movie. I know you're going to have like a million cool pieces of trivia, but <laughs> the, the little snippets of Manhattan in that film from, you know, whether they're in, you know, Washington Square Park yes. or Billy Crystal, you know, running down Fifth Avenue or whatever, that it's just, New York is so part of the fabric of that film that it absolutely, I think, belongs on the list. But you're right. I mean, you get so caught up in everything else because everything about this film is just so good. Yeah. I mean, you talk about the script. You talk about how drawn you are to these characters. You almost forget, you know, the third lead uh, character, which is the city. It's New York City. And, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that scene in the delicatessen, you know, I believe from what I've read, that wasn't even planned. It was Meg Ryan's idea to do that in the script. It only calls for the two of them to talk about women faking it, not actually for the woman to fake it. And my gosh, it's been such a, you know, it's embedded in our psyche now. When yeah. we think about romantic comedies, we think about this one scene and the actual deli, Katz's Delicatessen, I think it's on, it's on Houston Street, um, but they designated that area where Meg Ryan and Billy Crystal were, and you know, with a sign that says you should have what she's having or something to that effect. And I know you know this, but um, 
the people listening might not, which is that the woman who's watching Meg Ryan do her impression and says at the end of the scene, famously, the perfect punchline for that scene, I'll have what she's having, is Rob Reiner's mother in real life. <laughs> Which add even, adds even more to that scene. It's, it's unbelievable. <laughs> it's, all, it's, everyone's, it's awkward, embarrassing, and then you get the director's got his mom in the scene, like just <laughs> add another level of discomfort. Yeah, but uh, you know, doing the research on this movie for for this episode, y you you want to see the movie again, you know, uh -huh. because you you remember the first time, the second time you saw this movie. It's it's one of those movies that's really. Um, such a fun movie to watch all around. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna jump another decade and we're actually going to 1997 and we are going to transport you to Savannah, Georgia for Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Which, I mean, Savannah, if you've never visited, is such a fantastic place. It's so filled with this kind of sense of history. I mean, like the, in the sense of the same way that New Orleans is sort of, but with a completely different feel. It's a com it's, yes, you're right. Yes. It's like if Charleston and New Orleans had a baby on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Savannah, and if you've read the book, you know they talk about the Savannah kind of hospitality and yes. how you'll have, you know, have come in and have a cocktail, whether it's nine in the morning or seven uh -huh. at night. And, and I mean, you're right about Savannah, though. It's probably my top five of destinations in the U.S. There is something about that city that once you step onto it, it's like it's it's hauntingly beautiful. It's the way yeah. I describe it because I always just remember the very first time I went to Savannah and that that moss, the Spanish yeah. moss dripping from those gigantic mm -hmm. oak trees, the crepe myrtle, those squares that are just the perfect grid in the mm -hmm. center of the in the city. Um, so you know those squares. I actually did a travel story on Savannah. Those squares were designed to slow down traffic, not only to slow down the traffic, the flow of traffic, but also to entice the passers-by to just take a seat on the bench, um, you know, explore the park and the surroundings. It really mirrors the way of life for a lot of the locals there. Yeah, so yeah. you can only imagine, you know, if you've read the book, if you've seen the movie, what a murder mystery would do to a town like this. So the movie is based on this real life murder that happened in the 80s. Um, and it was, uh, the, the main suspect was an antiques dealer named uh, Jim Williams. Yeah, and so in the film, uh, the book is phenomenal as well. If you're looking for a book in that, you missed that one when it came out, that's a, uh, I mean, yeah. what? The descriptions of the town and the whole, I mean, what a wonderful writer. But the film, Kevin Spacey plays the antique dealer. John Cusack plays a reporter coming down to investigate uh, what's going on with this crime and this and um, the suspect and forms this very sort of unlikely friendship with this character who is, I have to say Kevin Spacey, I mean, I know he is not the um, you know, in anyone's good graces these days, but man, that guy can act. I mean, his character in this film is um, so wonderfully enigmatic and you never really know whether, you know, you, you like him, but you're not, but you still wouldn't be surprised if he does, you know what I mean? It's just, yes. he walks the tightrope of, of suspicion so well. And John Cusack is always an incredibly likable actor. I mean, I'll watch any film he's in. I'm a huge <laughs> fan of his, as we know from this podcast. Yes, yes. Um, so, um, but again, the setting of Savannah and this home in, in this beach town um, of Savannah, Georgia, which has this walled garden, which again, I mean, you use the word haunting, everything about this film is haunting it has a haunted quality to it the landscape adds it's giving me the heebie-jeebies as you talk about it because i remember it again here i mean honestly if you it's um a perfect setting i can't imagine why they don't shoot more films there it's 
so phenomenal with that, you know, kind of just ghostly feel of that Spanish moss that, mm -hmm. that, that the whole town and the whole, and that slow, deliberate manner yes. of everyone brings with it a sort of natural mystery that, you know, makes that town very compelling for yes. any sort of mystery or thriller or suspense film. So. You're right. And the property that you mentioned is the Mercer House. Um, in yes. which the real life Jim Williams lived and where the murder um, happened. Yes. And the Mercer House was built for you, Mercer, who was the great grandfather of Johnny Mercer, the songwriter. Yes. And, um, you know, um, I believe you see you see his um, his sculpture or something at the beginning of the film, Johnny Mercer. He's probably yes. Savannah's most famous son. He's there, right. Yes. He's, I was going to say, he's Savannah's beloved son and his yes. music is infiltrates the film. Yes, and, yes. Um, you know, adds another layer. When we do music, we can remember the Johnny Mercer music from Exactly, this exactly. Yeah, Johnny Mercer. And of course, you know, most famous for Moon River. And they talk about, you know, when you, you do your research on Johnny Mercer, talking about how that's the Savannah River that he was alluding to and, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, and then you combine that with Clint Eastwood and his subtlety in directing this movie. And I think most people don't realize that Clint Eastwood directed this film. Yes, because he was so not there it's like just a very light touch even the soundtrack yeah. was so light you know right all right so from there we're going to take a trip to the fiji islands specifically monoriki island in fiji for castaway which came out in the year 2000 deb and i mean okay so i was kind of laughing as i was going through this list uh -huh. and Initially, almost every film I had on it was a lone character or lone traveler, and you'd be amazed how many there are. I mean, I ended up having to cut a lot of them. Yeah. Diane Lane and Under the Tuscan Sun, yes. or Julia Roberts and Eat Love Prey, and the ones that still are on the list. But it makes sense that these films with kind of a single featured actor on some sort of a journey would um that the setting would be a huge part of it and other than wilson the volleyball <laughs> and uh, tom hanks's character the island was um the setting was a huge part of that film so much so that i i can't i don't know the exact statistic but it was something like tourism to fiji doubled or tripled after I they, believe it that film was released because so many people were dying to see that gorgeous gorgeous place with the waterfalls and the forest and the beautiful beaches and that water so yeah that's definitely a destination film oh my gosh yeah if you're fortunate enough to be able to go to Fiji definitely so um you're talking about how you're right, and that makes a lot of sense because as a way to kind of provide contrast to a location, you just have the one character. But for Castaway, we've got another character joining us, an inanimate object named Wilson, <laughs> the volleyball. And um, so this one I found really interesting and kind of strange, but I guess it would make sense. They actually had dialogue written for Wilson in the script. Uh, just so Tom Hanks can have more natural interaction with, with this ball, you know, um, a back and forth conversation. So there was actual dialogue for Wilson the volleyball, which Tom, I guess, kept in mind as he's having a convo with the ball. So I found that really, really interesting. And um, there were three different Wilsons and one of which just recently sold at auction for $18,400 for a volleyball. You could also, you know, get replicas for about $20, but if you want the real Wilson, that's about how much it's going for. <laughs> Good Lord. And I read, I did see an interview one time where um, 
Tom Hanks, someone asked him if they, he had named the volleyball Wilson after his real life wife, Rita Wilson. Yes. And he laughingly said no, it was because of the brand of the volleyball and that Rita Wilson's real name was like Golden Blatt or something like he's, he's like, well, considering her actual name is blah, blah, blah. Uh-huh. It was, uh-huh. uh, but it was a very cute <laughs> from Tom Hanks. Of course, he would come up with something like that. <laughs> All right. So we mentioned that Castaway came out in 2000, actually one of three films we're featuring on the list that came out in the year 2000. A good year for destination movies. Oh my goodness, and what destinations. My, uh, so the next one, we're gonna take you to a different part of the world, and that is to um, Beijing and parts of the Anhui province in China for Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, that was just a cinematographic marvel when it came out. Oh my gosh, I was just captivated by all those shots. And I've literally been practicing this all morning, so I'm going to say where this movie was set in Xu Zhaoshuang. Oh, <laughs> um, okay. Thank you very much. I'm glad uh, you got to say that and not me, because I wasn't yeah. sure. <laughs> That's okay. Good to see you guys. Um, yeah, but this was Ang Lee. I mean, for Americans, I would say uh, this was Ang Lee's breakthrough moment was this film, which was this fantasy, martial arts. I, you didn't really know, it was very hard to categorize this film. I can remember seeing it the first time and thinking, what is this? Like, you just kind of had to open your mind and sit back and enjoy this And get lost in it, yes. Piece. I mean, every shot of this movie was gorgeous. Uh, I think back when pe- whenever people say, I know, People think of that high, high bridge, stone bridge in the, at the temple and towards the end of the film. For me, the scenes in that movie that really like, you know, kind of made you gasp were this bamboo forest. Yeah. Where these characters were <laughs> racing like up on top of the bamboo and through the bamboo forest. And, you know, for someone, for I'm a fairly provincial person and I've never, been to China and never been in a bamboo forest. It, it, it was such a sight to see. It was the coolest thing. It's so mesmerizing. And it, you're still taking in that scene and they've moved on to the next scene and, and you're still, you know, lost in what, what was that they were doing? And yeah. it would interest you to know that most of the lead actors did their own stunts. And really all they did was have the invisible wire, you know? Um, so yeah, That's so cool. that even adds to really the the, the accomplishment, uh, the depth of the accomplishment of this film. And you mentioned uh, Ang Lee, and he's one of my favorite directors. And it's specifically for films like this, where you are just captivated by the, the, the beauty of, of the film itself. And apparently for Ang Lee, this, is, this was his most intense film that he's had to deal with. He was actually, um, he took up smoking again <laughs> during the making of this film, because as you can imagine, so many moving parts, you're not only worried about, you know, filming in general, but, you know, the safety of your actors on those wires and, and yeah. just for everything to come together, the choreography of those, some of those shots. My yeah. goodness. Yeah, I mean, it, coordinating all that stuff, I just can't Im- imagine. And it always, when I think of that film, there is a scene in the television show, Will and Grace, where Deborah Messing comes out of the, her bedroom and says, I just had a sex dream about Ang Lee. And, <laughs> you know, and, um, and Will says to her, how did you have a sex dream about Ang Lee? And she goes, well, it was slow moving, but visually stunning. Ah. <laughs> so oh, like, that's great. Line. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> so this film was really groundbreaking in so many ways. It became the first foreign language film to earn more than $100 million at the box office in the U.S., and also, um, it got 10 Academy Award nominations, 
won for best foreign language film, which was a given, given, you know, the greatness of this film. And of course, cinematography and art direction, and we weren't surprised about that at all either. All right, for our third film that came out in 2000, we're going back to the beach. Um, this time, we are going to Thailand. The 2000 film, The Beach, is what we're talking about. And it stars Leonardo DiCaprio, and it is set um, on in a secluded, not the whole movie, but the big money shot is this beach in this cove um, off Kofi Filet Island, or Kofi Fi is what you said. So we'll yeah. have to get the pronunciation manager in to help us. Um, I think off, specifically off. that shot, though, it's it's they they refer to it as Maya Bay, that yes. part okay. of the beach. Yes. Um, so anyway, it's an okay movie. I would watch Leonardo DiCaprio do almost anything. It's, um, this was fairly early in his career, 20 years ago, if you can believe it. I know. Um, uh, about, and he plays a traveler who stumbles upon this mystery that he's trying to solve. And part of it alludes to this um, secluded paradise, which they choose the location um, near Phuket in, Ch in Thailand, which is, you know, fabulously beautiful with these known for these mile deep and long white beaches with this beautiful blue water it's worth seeing for the setting which for is the setting yes really the definition of a destination movie there's a couple of films on this list that i would say even if you hated the actors hated the story that you would still have enjoyed the movie you just want that eye candy so yeah and this is certainly one of those so ironically, you know, this movie, the plot centers around this man, uh, this young man, Leonardo DiCaprio's character, and he's searching for a pristine, unspoiled beach. Uh, there's, I don't know if you've heard the controversy surrounding this location, but when they went into filming, the location itself was chosen not for its natural beauty primarily, but for its um, possibility of landscape redesign because oh. the filmmakers were looking for something that fit their specification. You know, they had to make room for that volleyball uh, scene. Uh -huh. And also what they did apparently was they brought in non-native palm trees onto the island to make it appear as lush and inviting as you see in the movie. I did not know that. Yes. Yeah, so what it's really shrouded in controversy right now because, as you can imagine, uh -huh. after filming wrapped up, it, that's when they started to see the effects of what was done to the environment. And you know, it's not only the, the film itself, but it's coupled with the redevelopment that happened on that site post film with uh, the beachfront hotels and everything. So, right now, they're dealing with. Um, you know, really damage to marine life and the surroundings. And in fact, in 2018, just two years ago, that particular location was closed to tourists. The government closed it to tourists because they had to, they had to fix what was, what was damaged. And, um, you know, I mean, if you can only imagine, it was getting up to 5,000 visitors a day, that little secluded spot, and it was because of the movie. Yeah. And so it's kind of ironic what has happened yeah. to this location. And it was also this location, along with a lot of the locations in this film, uh, were really devastated by that tsunami, the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004. So it's really gone through a lot since then. Yeah. Well, I mean, and maybe we should take it off the list. I mean... Well, you can't travel right now anyway, yeah. and if you wanted to, you're going to have some major restrictions facing you because of the fact that, you know, yeah. but again, we're talking about escapes, and so yeah. if you see this movie, you'll definitely escape. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> All right, so this is a different kind of escape. We're talking literally and figuratively. We're going to 2004 Sideways which was shot in the central coast of California, uh, California wine country around Santa Ynez Valley in Santa Barbara. And, oh, I love this movie. This was just funny, funny, funny. Uh, really, and uh, what a, a rebirth for Thomas Hayden Church. I mean, this was his 
big phoenix rising from the ashes of his career to play Paul Giamatta's uh, sidekick as they go on this double date to the wine country. Jack and, and Miles. <laughs> and um, I will say that the setting is phenomenal. If you've ever been to, I don't think they go as far up as Napa and Sonoma. No, uh -uh. But it's just it's beautiful California wine country. Um, they stay at a vineyard. The reason that the film doesn't leap to mind for its setting is because the writing is so magnificent that it overshadows the location. Um, the, it is such a smart, well-written, well-acted screenplay with Paul Giamatta. I mean, there's a scene when he's describing the wine and it's his, it, unwittingly, he's describing his own personality. And it's just such, a refreshing, smart, funny film mm -hmm. um, about romance in a very real way. It's not a fairy tale story. It's these two guys dating these two women and with two very different mindsets about relationships. And then to the cherry on the Sunday of this film is the setting. Yes. I remember the first time I saw that film. Yes, you're right. You're caught up in the screenplay because it was so well written, the interaction between these two characters. Um, but yes, the, the setting itself, it, it had such an impact on that wine region in California, of course. And it, it you know, the tourists came later. You, you've got the hitching post, which was that, that, the bar yeah. and grill that they went to, um, all the the wineries that they stopped. But my favorite scene in this movie is probably one of the scenes that had the most impact on the wine industry in that region. And I'm sure you'll remember this. Oh. They were getting ready to meet the ladies for dinner. And before they got into the restaurant, uh, Jack accosts Miles outside the restaurant and pretty much, you know, just tells him to behave and tells him, you know, it, if you want to drink, uh, if they want to drink Merlot, you're drinking Merlot. And Miles says, if anyone orders Merlot, I'm leaving. I'm not drinking any effing Merlot. And well, you know what happened to the sales of Merlot? They dropped about 2% drop in Merlot sales. And that scene that you were talking about with Miles describing Pinot Noir, pretty much describing how he is as a person. Sales of Pinot Noir skyrocketed about 20% increase in Pinot Noir. I didn't stop drinking Merlot after this film, but it just goes to show, you know, what a film like this and the kind of impact it would have on whole industries. <laughs> I know, it was very, all of a sudden Merlot, which was the completely appropriate red wine to order whenever you sat down, <laughs> all of a sudden was like ordering you know, um, box wine or a red Zinfandel or a, a Pinot Noir instead. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that, so the film is sideways and if you haven't seen it, you really ought to see it just for the laughs, just to see that scenery. Yeah. And you know, we were talking about that screenplay and the critics agreed with us, Deb. I mean, it was the first film to win a uh, major screenplay award from all five major critic groups. So we're talking the Oscars, the Golden Globes, BAFTAs, yes. what have you. That's so well yeah. deserved, yeah. Yes. And so we're going to go completely um, different here in terms of setting. And we are going to the, the Red Rocks of Southeast Utah, Canyonlands, Moab. And we are talking about a film from 2010, 10 years ago already. And it is the film 127 Hours of Force Inspired based on a real life story. Um, yeah, and while this is the second film, um, Danny Boyle directed yes. the speech. Uh, he also directed James Franco in this true story, 127 Hours, about a hike, a rock climber um, who's trapped uh, in, loses an arm. I mean, spoiler alert, everybody knows what happened. Yeah. Um, I think you know going in. <laughs> yeah. And uh, again, this is another film with a storyline. It's, first of all, it's 
hideously uncomfortable you're because you're watching this movie and everybody knows what's going to happen in the film so there's this sort of discomfort um you know waiting for the inevitable it's you know kind of a build up to this big right amputation that happens in this film however if you watch it a second time or watch it with an eye for the setting at this Blue John Canyon um, in a homestead crater out in Utah, these copper colored rocks in these absolutely alien formations. I mean, it's some of the most beautiful scenery. Uh, and, you know, the we always, I think Americans in particular, when we think of destination films, films in gorgeous locations, we think of Italy and we think of the Alps, you know, the sound of music, or we think of, you know, Lost in Translation in Tokyo or the things, you know, you and I have kicked around. When these settings in the US that just aren't, don't leap to mind immediately, but are such strange, beautiful places that a lot of Americans Oh, they're otherworldly. Yeah, it's exactly. Incredible. Oh, yeah. I mean, we were actually in Moab, where a lot of the film was shot, just in November. And you just pick a spot, any spot, and look around, and you'll be surrounded by these red rock formations, by the stunning mesas. I mean, it is just beautiful country out there beautiful enough for for this film to actually you know be shot against and you've got spielberg with indiana jones and the last crusade um a lot of it was shot in this area as well and so was uh thelma and louise so it's yes. really made a mark in a lot of movies yeah but you're right i mean you don't really think of it as a destination when, when you're trapped under a boulder. No, um, <laughs> not like and, that, no. And well, and like Castaway, this was another lone character in a beautiful place. It's another one of those films. So it gives you time as a viewer to appreciate the scenery, which is incredible. Yes, definitely. And um, the, the man in the center of this story, his name was Aaron Ralston. And he actually made a video diary while he was going through that ordeal. And the, the videos are actually now stored in a bank vault and only his close friends and family have seen it. Plus also um, during filming, Danny Boyle, the director and James Franco were allowed to see some parts of it so that they are able to be accurate when when portraying what actually happened down there. Well, that's interesting. And I think this is, in my opinion, James Franco's best role. Um, he's done a huge variety of films, so it's hard to really pick with him, but this was, in my opinion, his best acting. I think so, not just for the acting, but just the physical endurance. You know, mm -hmm. he apparently went through a lot of that and and tried to really nail it. So, yeah. so yeah. All right, so completely different, and we're gonna jet set over to Europe, and we're going to go to Paris for 2011's Midnight in Paris. Such a magical, magical movie. Deb, why is this on your list? Honestly, I this is one of those movies. I walked out of this movie and immediately told, called a couple of my friends and my parents and said, go see this movie. It's like visiting Paris. Yes. It, Woody Allen is such a master of incorporating his settings into his story without being heavy handed, just, just melding the location into the plot. And this movie is the perfect example of it, more so I think than any others, even though Woody Allen is notorious for his love affair with New York City. This film, which features Owen Wilson, again, it's a huge ensemble cast, as is typical of Woody Allen, features Owen Wilson as a sort of frustrated writer who goes to Paris, um, with a big for a big family outing and magically is transported back in time to this incredible era of the expats of the oh. 20s and 30s and 
F. Scott Fitzgerald and Zelda Fitzgerald and Hemingway and every, you know, all the icon, iconic expatriate writers in Paris. And it's a great movie of, in and of its own right, but really the highlight of the film for me is this, these shots of Paris, which are just works of art. Oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, definitely, I would say the city of Paris was in the lead role for this movie because you're right, yeah. it really takes you there. You know, he really captured the, the touristy spots of the city, but yeah. he also captured the really gritty spots. You know, Paris at night can be kind of gritty if you don't yeah. know where you're going, you know, you yeah. get lost and yeah. So he really did. And um, I think it, it was very telling that the film opens with like a, a really long montage, almost postcard-like montage yes. of, of Paris to kind it's of like tell you. It's like a show from my vacation. <laughs> yeah, so it's setting you up that this yes. film is, is all about Paris. And um, also bonus points for him for including Giverny, which is a 45-minute mi drive away from the city, and that is Claude Monet's uh, home yeah. where you have the water lilies and the green, bright green bridge and the wisteria. So, um, so yeah, such a beautiful, beautiful film. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, it's really, and it, even if Paris is not my number one travel destination, that movie is my number one destination film just because of the, this, it's just an exercise in urban, incorporating urban beauty into a film in every way. It's fantastic. It is, it really is. Um, and so we are going to head back to Asia for our next film, 2011. And we are going to India for the best exotic Marigold Hotel. And I believe um, shooting took place primarily in Jaipur for this movie. I, yes. And um, God, this is, uh, what a fantastic movie. Um, <laughs> I, you know, when, when these films that feature um, an older cast of characters who are iconic, you know, w well established actors, films like Cocoon or Red with Bruce Willis and Morgan Freeman. This is another example of this cast of characters who are basically moving in. They're basically outsourcing retirement <laughs> communities. And they are moving into what they soon discover is a very decrepit hotel in Jaipur. And, um, but exotic. But exotic. <laughs> the best exotic Marigold, Marigold Hotel. And Sunny, their innkeeper. And it's this comedic ensemble, charming cast, worth seeing the movie of only, it's worth seeing the movie for the comedy, it's worth seeing the movie for the uh, acting, it's worth seeing the movie for the storyline, and it's worth seeing the movie for the setting, which is when these actors work, stay in this hotel and also venture into the marketplace. I was going to say, that's also part of the character and the charm of this movie, because you see a lot of that. You see that the marigold market and just that burst of color, you know, you could almost taste yes. this, the setting because um, it plays such a role and, and they ride those those um, tricycles, you know, mm -hmm. where you, you sit in, in the cab of a motorcycle. And um, yeah, and you're right about just this particular cast. They have such a, a, a comfort being around each other. You know, I wouldn't be surprised. I didn't see this anywhere, but I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of those scenes were improvised mm -hmm. just because they Absolutely. use that, that comfort of, of being with each other in each other's company. And when you have that kind of veteran talent, you know they're playing around a bit. I mean, what a, oh, to be a fly on the wall and that I know. Crack, crack wall of that hotel to watch those scenes being shot would have been amazing. Yeah, just to show you, outside of Dev Patel, who is, of course, probably the youngest one in this cast, um, all the princi principal actors in this movie were in their early to mid-60s to late 70s. So that kind of gives you a range of the age of these actors. 
Yeah. And um, so, yeah, it was fun. And it was such a win-win because you have this great cast, this great script, and then you had that location to, to put them in. Right. So Yeah, absolutely. All right. So we are down to our final film on the list. This is relatively recent compared to the other films we've been talking about. And we're going to take you on a trip to northern Italy. Uh, and we are going to talk about Call Me By Your Name. Which... Um again, is a, is a film that is so beautifully acted that the setting, while fabulous, like in uh, Sideways, is a gorgeous backdrop to an incredibly compelling, interesting film starring Army Hammer and Timothy Chalamet. And it's a story of young love and um, coming of age and all you know just a, a, the, the it's emotionally packed this film oh yeah and what um they could not be set in a more beautiful place in um, <laughs> lombardy italy in this northern oh. italian town with the piazzas and the architecture everything about this movie is so visually breathtaking, including the men, I might add. Oh my God, hello, yes. Talk about escape. I mean, this movie took you on a trip to that Italian region. You were right there with Elio and Oliver. You were riding their bikes. You were drinking the coffee. You were reading the books. You were hanging out by the pool with them. I mean, so, from what I understand, yeah. that's actually what these two lead actors did, not just during filming, but after hours. You know, they pretty much mirrored what the locals in this community did, you know, which was to work hard eight hours a day. And after that, you really, you know, just kicked up your feet <laughs> exactly you you went out you you dined al fresco you uh listened to music you went to the movies so drank espresso at night i mean that's what they did <laughs> yeah and i mean that's this is a movie that will make you long to take that trip to you know northern italy that's on your bucket list it's yes it's, it'll get you calling the travel agent or booking things online because it's so gorgeous. Everything visually in this movie is flawless. Every, the shots are very well thought through. The actors beautifully placed, like the, the movement, every visual cue in this film I think is spot on. Oh, definitely. And it was so well received when it came out. In fact, when the film premiered at the New York Film Festival, it received a 10 minute standing ovation. And they're saying that it's the longest ovation in history at the festival. So wow. that really just goes to show yeah. how impressed audiences were with this film. It's just jaw dropping. And the story, you know, just the plot, it was so yeah. great. Yeah, it's a yeah. very moving story. It's again, you know, when you've got all these other elements that are phenomenal in a film, it's hard to just say like it's the setting is why it's on our list because you don't really, it, it wouldn't be the first thing you'd notice about this film. It's yeah. probably falls behind the acting and the storyline and, you know, so, but it is a gorgeous setting. Absolutely. Right, right. And, it, you know, like, especially for this film, if you are unfamiliar with it when you first see it and you're trying to figure out what's going on with these characters, it's easy to get wrapped up in the story and try to figure out what is going on and ignore yeah. what's around them. Yeah. And once you realize that that kind of plays a part in, in the development of these two and, and that summer that, that they spent together, it's just, it's just great, you know, all yeah. around. All right, so whether you needed an escape to explore the Italian countryside or jet off to Paris, or marvel at the red rock formations in Utah, or maybe just get lost in the hustle and bustle of New York City. We hope we were able to help you escape if only for a few minutes, but you know what? You can extend that and check some of these movies out. Most of them, if not all of them, are available on these streaming services. So you really have no excuse. Yeah, and there's, it's, it's a great way to escape when we're all sort of stuck at home these days. So. <laughs> That's right. 
movie and take a trip in your mind. Exactly. And for our signature sweet finish, we are still continuing to harvest what's in season. And Deb, this is a little bit of a, a surprise. We have fresh local zucchini that we're working with for our sweet treat. And we are going to pair that with lemon for lemon zucchini bread. It is perfect to with that espresso that you're gonna have while yeah. watching Call Me By Your Name. But, oh my gosh, I have made two batches of this bread already. It is the lightest, most delightful bread. I, You know, zucchini bread I love already, but when you add that lemon, it adds another yeah. layer to it. And it's got a, a really light lemon frosting. And again, just really easy to make with very simple ingredients. It's a winner. Buy me up anything lemon I'm on board for. But yeah, it's it's just so yummy and really, really a treat. Again, perfect morning, afternoon, or evening, whatever. Um, yeah, it's I, I love this recipe. I'll give it a try. I can't wait. All right. Of course, you will find that recipe on gazellemagazine.com. And also, be sure to be among the first to, to view our latest episodes of The Stir. And you can do that really easily by clicking on the Gazelle icon on the screen to sign up to be a subscriber to Gazelle Magazine's YouTube channel. So, Deb, thank you for another fun show. And we are already working on the next show, which we, we guarantee you it's going to be another fun list. Thanks for having me, Trish. Have a good day. Have a good See day. See you later.